shout and touch the Lord as He passes by. You find He's not too busy to hear your cry. He's passing by this moment your needs to supply. Reach out. Hi, and welcome to Reach Out with the Lynns. I'm Jerry Lynn. And I'm Kelly Lynn. And we're going to talk today about sharing your faith. Come, see, and go tell. That's what the angel said to the women as they came to the empty tomb. Come, see. The tomb is empty. He is not here. He is risen. And then go tell the disciples. Go tell everybody you possibly can that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead, and he, and he alone, is Lord and Savior. This is part two. In part one, we talked about the experience of Peter coming to the empty tomb, then seeing the Lord in his resurrected state that evening, and then on another occasion, and other occasions, and then going out and telling others about Jesus, and salvation came to many because of his witness. Today we're going to talk about the Apostle Paul. Part two, come see and go tell. Honey, would you lead us in prayer, please? Sure. Heavenly Father, we just thank you and praise you for this opportunity to come before you today. We ask that, Lord, you would prepare the hearts of those who are listening to this word. Uh, Lord, help it to be anointed and help it to the word to go forth and do the purpose that you would want it to do this day. We ask you to be with us now, and we ask for the Holy Spirit to come and sit with us and teach us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. We're going to look at the witness of the Apostle Paul as he shares his testimony of how he came to see and then went to tell. He didn't see the empty tomb, but he saw the Lord spiritually. He had been persecuting the church uh, in verse... Uh, 1 of chapter 26, and again, if you've got your Bible handy, please take it and turn with us to Acts chapter 26. Paul is um, uh, in prison, and he is uh, being uh, really persecuted because of his sharing of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Jews have stirred up the Roman authorities and want him arrested, and they want him killed. Well, he had no choice. He had to appeal to Caesar. And being a Roman citizen... Rome had such power at that time, and being a Roman citizen had such power, that no matter what your predicament was legally, you could say, I appeal to Caesar. And they had to stop the proceedings legally, couldn't put him to death. They had to bind him and then send him to Caesar for a trial. God was in all that because you know what happened. He did go to Rome and no doubt had a chance to testify to Caesar because God wanted the ruler of the world to hear the good news about Jesus being saved. And so he wants everybody possible to hear that good news, and that's where you and I come on in. We're looking at Paul sharing his faith. You and I need to share our faith as well. So he is being brought before King Agrippa, who is going to be the one that's going to hear his case and then send him to Rome. And honey, read verse 1, if you would, of chapter 26. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you are permitted to speak for yourself. So Paul stretched out his hand and answered for himself. Now we pick it up. Let's go to verse 9. Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them, often in every synagogue, and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. This was Saul before he came to know the Lord. He was a zealot. He was thinking he was defending Judaism and that it was wrong to become a Christian and it was wrong to follow Jesus. And he did all he could to arrest Christians and consent to their death. 
Talk about a heavy burden of sins you have committed. And talk about the grace of God that freed him and frees you and me from all the sins we have committed. So he's giving his testimony. I was a chief persecutor of Christians. And now he's going to recount his conversion. And uh, we'll pick it up, honey, with verse 12. He's talking to the king, King Agrippa, uh, who was a, a, a son of Herod. And um, now let's hear how he tells his testimony of how he got saved and how he shared the good news. Well, thus occupied as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, along the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and those who journeyed with me. This was Saul. And when we all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So I said, who are you, O Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, the sovereignty of God, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as, <clears throat> as well as from the Gentiles to whom I know I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Amen. So here we find that God is uh, giving him an empty tomb experience, if you will, and uh, he is apprehending him, knocking him to the ground, speaking to him and him alone. The others heard, uh, as he told elsewhere, that it sounded like thunder, but they couldn't hear the particular words. Sometimes God speaks to you and those around you can't really understand it. Well, uh, he told him that uh, uh, his name was then Saul, that's the Hebrew name, it would be changed to the Roman version of Paul. And uh, the Lord identified and he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Interesting little side note there that when he was persecuting the followers of Jesus, he was persecuting Jesus. When people are persecuting you because of your faith, they're really persecuting Jesus, aren't they? Don't take it personally. You're just the messenger. And so uh, he then tells and him... And those were his Jewish brothers and sisters yes. who had believed on Jesus. When I read this, I, I, you'll learn after you get to know me that I just grieve when anything when it happens to Jewish brothers and sisters. It just grieves my heart. And so I can just feel... God's Spirit in that as we read that. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what we talk about when the Holy Spirit comes over you and you have that overwhelming compassion or that empathy or you can re feel what it was like to, to walk this. And so sometimes God will do that to me. It's a gift that he's given me. And so as I felt that and I see that and then as we look down here, I think of the character of God and how God often allows us something we do to others, and then we have to walk it out. And now he's going to bring news to him. And then, of course, we learn later on, Saul, who becomes Paul, has to walk it out and experience some of the things that he has done. It, to me, it's, it's amazing. That's right. He'll suffer a great deal. Uh, when he um, was blinded, he then had to... Uh, uh, really for, for three days basically he had to uh, be alone with the Lord and then a messenger came and told him that uh, the Lord said tell Paul the great things he'll suffer uh, because of my faith and he did have to suffer much uh, uh, from the hands of Jews in particular and so um, but they were unbelievers uh, they were unbelievers that's right I mean, they, 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 didn't, they did they were, they in were ignorance un un you know, they, yeah. Yeah. they did it in ignorance but they still persecuted him tried to put him to death stoned him whipped him with rods with straps and but what Paul had done yeah. to them yep yeah. and so uh, he suffered much for his faith but he was faithful he never gave up 
And um, so he, he wants, in verse 18, let's read that again, honey. This is the mission that he has. And this is what happened to him. Mm -hmm. To open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. My gosh, this is the prayer that we need to be praying for those who commit abortions. Open their eyes. Uh, or any sin, for that matter. And we're all sinners, aren't we? We're all sinners, and we need to pray for all who are committing any sin of any sort. Open their eyes, Lord. And only God, only, only God can open the eyes That's of right. people. That's right. You have to pray, Lord. Just have to pray. Open their eyes. Or whatever it is, you whatever you pray. It. You know someone's yeah. doing something that's a horrendous thing, and you can't, you know, pray for them. Pray the scripture, right? You know, we can't legislate it, and you can't uh, dictate it. Only God can open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Paul is a master of summarizing the gospel in one verse. He does it time and time again. You can take so many of these verses and it's a complete sermon. It's a complete message. And that's not something that you can find with the other writers of the, of the different uh, books of the Bible, the way he could get with Paul. He can summarize it. He has an incredible mind and he really never gets his mind off of what the salvation He's a brilliant, message is. brilliant man. Yep. And so again, that, that just to repeat for the third time, and here's the message that Paul had, here's the message you and I have. Open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. Wow. That they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. That's yeah, and, a good sermon. and that's salvation right there. That's it. That's See, the it essence. all begins, we can, we can all point out millions of sins, but really it all comes down to salvation. Mm -hmm. Salvation, we need, and then let God work in their lives. We don't need to point out everybody's problems. We really need to say, like they said here, uh, how, do you, how, how can you see if your eyes aren't open that you need a Savior and that we're all sinners? All of us are sinners before God. And he said, this is the way to salvation. It's through my son. doesn't matter if you're Jewish, Muslim. You still, there's still one way. It's my son I sent. He's my son. And I want you to believe on him. Then your sins are blotted out. And then they come from, didn't say that literally something fell. Wasn't he blinded? He was blinded, and uh, then his eyes were opened as if there were scales that were dropped from his eyes. That's right. God he used was, that. Yep. It's interesting, because he blinded him physically in order to give him light spiritually. And sometimes God does that. He'll do sure. something physical in the physical world That's right. to show us something in the spiritual world. Something just happened uh, not too long ago. I got a second with my daughter. Oh, I can't talk about it. But anyways, with my daughter. And so um, we watched this problem in our family. And I just kept saying, I don't feel right now is not the time. I'm not hearing from God. I'm not hearing from God. And everybody was against me, except my husband and a few friends. And I kept saying, I, I, we're not, I'm not, neither one of us, we're not hearing from God. We have to hear from God. And, and so I'm looking like I'm, a, I'm a not smart person. You're a nurse. You know what you're doing. You should know this. Nope, I'm not hearing from God. I have to wait on God. Come to find out that person, that situation rallied around and uh, turned around. And if we had intervened, it could have caused some problems. So we continued with the medications and all we needed to do. And so um, my daughter came to me and she said, Mom, <clears throat> I have to tell you, God is working in my life, and he's used this situation. I don't know why, but I'm seeing him really, really strong in my life now. And so I went through a little bit of suffering with my children over this and some disagreement, and I was just about to give in and thinking, maybe I'm wrong. Yet in my spirit, I felt I was 
that God was doing something. Sure enough, God was doing something. And he's strengthening my youngest daughter's spiritual life and her faith. And, you know, I'm watching her. She's had health problems. She's, had a, she's got a problem with her, uh, an autoimmune disease problem, and the Lord is working through that, and he's working in her, and, and I see this. So God works all these things together in our lives for good if we let him. Amen. And that includes <coughs> the current crisis, the pandemic, COVID-19, and we are in the midst of that. Uh, let's look for the silver lining. All things are working together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. What's the lesson here? Lord, what can I learn from this experience and help <coughs> others to learn lessons as well? We're finding people turning to Jesus and watching uh, programs like this and others uh, and looking for the Lord. And so uh, it's an ill wind that does not blow someone some good. My late father used to say, I hate to say it, but because of this lack of interest in God and going to church, what this country needs is a war, a good war. He was a veteran of World War II. Well, we're in a war right now. And so look for good to come out of this, and of course for healing uh, uh, for families and for individuals and as what well. about I love, the, I love the sayings from his family, I, and I know some of them from mine. What about the trees? They never let the trees oh. <laughs> Can you tell them that no, one? That, that's, that's another time. We'll, go, <laughs> we'll make you hold off on that one. There. All right. Uh, that, that, that's more of the area of pride. Have you ever noticed about somebody who's Mr. Big yeah, or Mrs. Them. Big? My grandmother, uh, used, my great grandmother, used to say, "God never lets the trees grow too tall; uh, they're always even." If you look at a landscape, you look at the trees in the back of the church here; they're all pretty much even. You don't find one big tree above another. And so, uh, I'm Mr. Big. I am more important in business or in ministry or in politics. God or takes you. care of everything. Oh, God has a way of evening things out. So uh, that's another story. But let's get back to Paul. He has been given a commission. I've been given a commission, you've been given a commission, we've got a choice. Either reject it and embrace the three S's. You know what the three S's are? Mm. I am saved, I'm going to sit and soak and sour. I am going to be saved, I'm going to watch programs on television about the Lord, I'm going to read the Bible, but I'm not going to share my faith with anybody. I'm going to sit, soak, and sour. That's not what God wants us to do. We need to get the good news out. And so Paul here is in verse 19 telling us he didn't just sit soaking sour. Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent, turn to God, and do works befitting repentance. For these reasons, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. Therefore, having ordained, obtained help from God, to this day I stand witnessing both to small and great, saying no other things than those which the prophets and Moses said would come, that the Christ would suffer, that he would be the first to rise from the dead, and would proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. So he was obedient. And he went far and wide. He prided himself in one case, and in a rather humble way, of saying that I have not built my ministry on another man's work. So go out there and share with somebody who perhaps uh, is working with you. Now, right now you have social distancing and probably working from home in many cases, but there are still other ways through Zoom and through FaceTime and all of that, Facebook and others, to share your faith. Get the good news out. Jesus is here. People are worried. People are in fear. Um, what's going to happen? Nobody knows. And uh, we're thinking that we're going to start to open uh, what, what uh, several states have already started to open and, and get back to normal. And uh, it's been uh, debated that it's too soon. And then what's going to happen this summer? And then what's going to happen in the fall? And then other variations. You can drive yourself crazy thinking about the permutations and combinations of problems. My mother used to say in German, Jerry, Emma, Ed Voss, always something. Guaranteed. This COVID-19 is going to be cured in some ways with a vaccine. Guaranteed, there'll be another problem. So always turn to Jesus. He will always be there for you. And Paul was faithful to get that good news out. And so he says, now he's turning it personally. I shared my faith. It's one thing to say to people, 
you know, Jesus can heal, he can heal COVID-19, and he will, he can do this, he can do that, but you've got to turn the spotlight on that person, and that's what he does here in verse 27. He talks right to the king himself. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. Mm, that happens to people, doesn't it? Almost. And Paul said, <clears throat> I would to God that not only you, <clears throat> but also all who hear me today might become both almost and altogether such as I am, except for these chains. So he wished that all on That's them. That's right. I, I wish you would be able to be saved and know the joy of knowing the Lord the way I do, except I, I wouldn't want you in chains the way I am right now, being imprisoned. And verse 30. When he had said these things, the king stood up, as well as the governor and Bernice and those who sat with them. Hmm. And when they had gone aside, they talked among themselves, saying, this man is doing nothing deserving of death or chains. Then Agrippa said to Festus, this man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. So they would have let him loose, except he appealed to Caesar. Well, was that a bad decision on Paul's part? No, he really had to, or they would have probably found a different way to get him killed. But uh, King Agrippa was sympathetic and uh, indicated his innocence. But Paul has to go to Caesar. He has to go to Rome. He'll write some of the wonderful epistles, such as the Philippian epistle, in Rome in a prison, and he probably is able to then <clears throat> talk to Caesar himself. Certainly those in Caesar's household were saved because of the Apostle Paul's witness. And so here's a man who was faithful. Come see and go tell. Come see that Jesus has been raised from the dead. The Apostle Paul put it so clearly to the Roman church. He was delivered up on that cross because of our sins. He was raised up for our justification. And so we need to share our faith. Don't sit, soak, and sour. You all know the map of Israel. You know how in the northern part of Israel, uh, there are uh, mountains mm -hmm. on the Lebanon border, and there are snows up there at times, and sources of water there begin to flow down into the Hula Valley, and they then flow into the Sea of Galilee, which is a freshwater lake. That's where the disciples did so much fishing. It's a freshwater lake because it has an inlet from that Jordan River coming from the Hula Valley all the way down, and then it releases, and it's purified because it releases, <coughs> and it flows on down to the Dead Sea toward the south. And the Dead Sea has an inlet and receives those waters from the Jordan, but no outlet. And that's why you can float on the Dead Sea. And that's why the Dead Sea is five times saltier than any other ocean in the world or sea or body of water. So the Galilee Sea is fresh and fish are there because there's an inlet and there's an outlet. The Dead Sea is dead because there's an inlet but no outlet. You and I need to have the inlet of being fed from God's word, from other Christians, from television programs, radio, YouTube, whatever, but you need an outlet. You need to share that faith. Lord, give me the boldness to be able to share my faith with others. It has to throw, flow through you. Absolutely, absolutely. We're like a conduit. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the more you share, the richer you become, it's more blessed to give than to receive. It's going to encourage your heart. And they may reject you. Paul didn't get a conversion, so far as we know, from Agrippa on that day. He didn't get many conversions, but he shared his faith. You're not being paid by the, uh, the witness. You're not being paid by the conversion. You're just being paid eternal life and the blessings of God to be a witness and to share. And we're spirit be beings. That's right. So that's why we're conduits. That's right. Spirit to spirit, heart to heart. Share your faith with others. But they need to come alive because right. really they're dead. That's a whole other. That's right. So let's uh, just give a brief uh, a plan of salvation. If you don't know the Lord, please pay attention to this. This is from uh, the book of Romans, some selected scriptures. And if you know the Lord, it's good to renew your faith. Uh, to re we, we had a chance to renew our wedding vows uh, a few months back, and it was refreshing to be able to, at the five-year mark of our marriage, to renew those vows. And I'm asking the Lord to keep me around another four and a half years so we can do it all over again, and another five, and another five, until I'm 120 years old like Moses. In any event, let's look at the plan of salvation. Everyone needs salvation, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 
Jesus died for our salvation. God demonstrated his own love toward us in that we were, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, 8. Salvation is a gift. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Romans 6, 23. The gift of God is eternal life. We are saved by grace, and if by grace, then it is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. Romans 11, 6. We're saved by grace. I remember the year that Mary Grace, I was pregnant for her. Everyone in our church, five girls, five women had babies, and we all had girls, and we named, had all had a gra- the word grace because we were feeling the grace of God. Just wanted to add that in there. Salvation comes through faith. To him who believes on him, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Romans 4, 5. And God saves all who call on him. <clears throat> Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You just call on the name of the Lord. It's that easy. Romans ten thirteen. These scriptures speak to your heart, and you're ready to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I'm going to pray, and you may pray after us. Repeat them in the privacy of your home or wherever you are. Dear Lord, I am a sinner, and I repent of my sins. I turn from my sins. I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I believe he died on the cross for me, and he was raised again, came back to life. He ascended into heaven to give me new spiritual life. I believe that happened. I ask the Lord Jesus Christ to come into my heart and to live his life in me and I promise to live my life for him. Thank you, Lord, for my salvation. I love you, Lord. I love you, and I praise you. Start praising him now. Say, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Lord. Praise your name. I just praise your name. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. And if you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, welcome to the family of God. You are now my brother or sister in Christ. We have a special relationship It's different than any other relationship. We understand each other right from the beginning just because, Jesus, we have something in common. Find a local church in your area that is teaching God's word. Ask the pastor to help you get started in your way to heaven. Thank you. Amen. And uh, don't forget to support your local church wherever you're fellowshipping and uh, give to that church. They still have expenses uh, they've still got salaries and uh, heat and light and, and rent and what have you. So uh, go on their website and give or uh, mail it in or drop it in their mailbox, whatever. Uh, and uh, pray for your uh, pastor and family uh, that they're going to continue to be able to uh, be filled with the joy of the Lord and his expectation because it's a bit scary to see uh, the uh, congregation not coming together. And many folks don't give. Uh, when they're not there in the church, they just don't give. Maybe they can't, maybe they're furloughed, maybe they forget, we don't know what it is. But you be faithful. And more importantly, as you give, you're going to receive. The Lord's going to take care of you. Give and it shall be given unto you, Jesus said in Luke. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will others give to you. And as you bring that tithe and offering into the storehouse, God's going to be faithful to and that's, return it to you. You know, that I, I always hate when we have to do this, but it's not for, it's people think, oh, it's just for you. No, it's not just for us. God promises in his word he'll rebuke the devourer in your life. And so if I never had to speak that word again, I would be wrong because I have to give the full word of God. God rebukes the devourer in our life. It is a promise. Amen. And Malachi. Amen. Until the next time, God bless you, stay safe in Jesus. Shalom. He's passing by this moment, your needs to supply.